Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Before we dive in, today's episode is brought to you by my free How to Stop Yelling at Your Kids course. If you would like to take this course, if you find yourself getting triggered and yelling or even just annoyed and frustrated and you want to know how you can stay calm when things are really tough, go to sarahrosensweet.com forward slash yelling where you can sign up for free for a very wonderful and effective course I've had a couple thousand people go through this course and I've heard great, great feedback about it. Again, go to sarahrosensweet.com forward slash yelling. Feel free to share it with a friend. If you personally don't need to uh, work on triggers or stopping yelling, feel free to share it with someone who does. Okay, back to our episode. Today's episode is a coaching episode with Candice. Candice is a mom of a nine-year-old girl who has ADHD, dyslexia, and some anxiety. And Candace was feeling really worried about some social challenges that she felt that her daughter was experiencing because of her differences and her neurodivergence. So we talked about what some things Candace could do and how she can sort of change the way that she's looking at the situation. Be sure to stick around until the end because we check back in in a month and see how things had shifted for Candace. I could certainly relate to some of the heartache that comes along with having kids who are different from uh, the average or the neurotypical kids. And I think it was a good conversation for me as well to have with Candace. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Candace. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Candace. I'm a mom of two kids, a nine year old and a six year old, and I live in Canada. All right. And full disclosure, I've known you for a few years in different contexts, so it's nice to see you again. (laughs) Nice to see you too. Okay, so how can I support you today? You know what we're we're trying to navigate right now? I have a nine-year-old daughter who is a little bit neurodiverse, and we're trying to kind of navigate the challenges of her her social life. And um, I think that's where we're kind of stuck, (laughs) where I'm stuck. Yeah, and I was hoping you might have some some wisdom because I'm having a hard time see it, seeing it, you know, clearly. So what's your daughter's name? And tell me a little bit about how her neurodivergence shows up. Sure. My daughter is named Elgin. She's a really bright, super sensitive kid who has dyslexia and ADHD. And her ADHD is mixed type, but it really comes across as a big emotionalism, like her self-regulation. And uh, quirky anyways, (laughs) has interesting intense interests, but they kind of are a bit different than her peers. Yeah, I guess that kind of sums her up a little bit. Definitely lagging behind in school. I think this is one issue, you know, struggling with schoolwork, struggling with big feelings. It doesn't help that she's actually a very big kid and has a big joyful personality. And I think people assume that she can handle sometimes more than she can, including Mm -hmm. her peers. It's hard when kids are large for their size because everyone assumes they're older. And then when you have a kid who has ADHD, they're often three to four years behind developmentally. So I can see how that would be super hard for Elgin. Right. And you. And you. And me. Yeah. I think that it's hard with, you know, I don't know if it's just mothers and daughters. She's at an age where she really wants to have, you know, deep she wants deep relationships with her friends and um, the sense of rejection that she kind of gets is intense for her and for me. (laughs) And I think that's what's making it so difficult because of course I adore her and it's hard when, you know, she's not being adored. (laughs) Oh, this is so familiar to me, Candice, because as you know, my daughter also has ADHD and she, for anyone listening, she gives me permission to talk about this and publicly she's actually very open about having ADHD and it was probably right around nine when she started to have some social 
challenges. I think, you know, the the features of ADHD of being sort of impulsive and blurting things out and having big, you know, even if it's positive, big energy seems pretty typical for a four-year-old or a five-year-old or a six-year-old. But as kids get older and they start to have more sort of self-control, you know, neurotypical kids, the, those neurodivergent kids tend, tend to stand out a little bit more as unusual or weird. Uh, you know, I, I hate to use that label, but I think that that's how sometimes they appear, right? Like our neurodivergent kids can appear a little bit weird. And I love weird. I have to say, I love weird. I know you love weird also. I do. Um, do. (laughs) I'm always like, don't you see like what an amazing human this is? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So just like one mother to another, I know how hard it is and what you're going through. And it's so painful to see people not appreciate how amazing our children are. That said, how are the challenges showing up for her right now? Like, is she getting rejected? Does she have any friends? Like, what's going on? Yeah, so she's had a couple of, like, primary relationships basically dissolve in the last year. And at first, I think it was harder. She seems to be weathering it well. But I I see it. I see what, you know, what I see is that she is starting to take it on um, in a confidence that I see that kids will kind of put her down and she'll accept it, you know, like that there's something happening there where this is where I'm kind of feeling like, no, this is not the direction I want this to go. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to fortify her and kind of also make her, I guess it's resilience, maybe. I don't know. It's just, I see her personality changing where people will be like, you're too much. And she's like, oh, okay. So, you know, she doesn't really have any best friends anymore. They've all kind Mm -hmm. of slipped away. And I also see it in parents inviting her a little less to things that's painful. And there's a couple of kids that maybe even bully her a little. And I'm embarrassed to say that I kind of talk to an older one, you know, I I don't know how not to bridge. She's at an age where I don't think she needs me to necessarily fight her battles. But I feel so protective around this, like I just feel so vulnerable about this aspect of my parenting her. Does she know she has ADHD? She does. And do you talk about how that does make her different than some other kids? We do. And lately we've been trying to fixate a little bit on her kind of strengths because she's had a full analysis. She has some real verbal strengths that are kind of off the chart. And I think in the past we've really focused or she's began to focus on her on her weaknesses. You know, she's dyslexic and profoundly dyslexic, so she has not learned how to read at all yet. And um, then it makes everything challenging in school. So she has this perception about being stupid. So we talk a lot about her strengths lately, what she likes, but I don't think she sees how the ADHD really fits in with that. She kind of focuses more on concrete details. You know, I don't know how to read. I don't know how to do math. You know, I'm too much for those people. You know, and I think you might say you, you are too much for some people. And then there are people who you are not too much for. And those are the people that we have to find and that, you know, not everyone likes everyone. And that's okay. And, you know, one thing that Christy Forbes, who's an Australian person who supports neurodivergent families, she talks about helping neurodivergent kids find their, find other neurodivergent kids. So I don't know if, I I don't know how you would do that, but I think that's something that you would, that you might want to keep thinking about. Like, how can we help her find other kids that are more like her? Like, I know a friend of our family uh, who's 18. She also has ADHD and my daughter's 15. And when they get together, they just have so much fun together and they like run around and, and like, I, they, they joke about how they like bring out each other's ADHD, but I think they both feel like they can really be themselves when they're together. Like they, they don't have to mask, you know, they don't have to rein in their impulses. They can be loud and giggly. And, and so it, it's not, doesn't happen very often, but it makes me feel really happy for my daughter when that does happen. So I think thinking in terms of like, as a long-term project, you know, what kinds of interests does she have that maybe are more interests that more neurodivergent kids might have that you can get her involved in things, helping her, you know, find her people. I think that's one thing to think about. Obviously, like, you know, maybe you can't do that next week, but over time, thinking about how can we, you know, help her feel like she's with peers that sort of normalize her differences. I think that's one thing to think about. Also, I'm wondering, how is your relationship with her? I think it's pretty good. You know, I think about parenting a lot. You know, she's my oldest child. I feel like she's kind of taken me on this journey. I'm a totally different parent than I was, you know, even a couple of years ago. And I really value our relationship and I feel close with her. 
you know, she's not warm like a person. She doesn't really like cuddle or like, she, you know, but I feel like I really share her interests. You know, I try to listen deeply. I, it feels pretty strong. Good. I think, yeah. Cause, cause I think that one thing that we can do as parents when our kids are lonely is try and fill the, fill that social gap a little bit. And I know it's not the same, you know, it's not the same as having a nine-year-old best friend, but it can help fill the loneliness gap. I think. That's a question I have. I guess I'm worried that maybe like, I don't want her to be like, I don't want to be also like, I guess that's good to know. I worry that maybe somehow I'm harming her by being, you know, her, her closest friend when maybe she should have more peer relationships. I think you're filling a need that she has, a deep need that she has for connection and for like mirroring her wonderfulness that you see. Like that's what we want from a friend, right? And even if it's your mom, (laughs) you would rather have, you know, your friend doing it. It's still really important. And I, I honestly think that I have done that for my daughter for a lot of years. And I think it's why she has really good self esteem at 15, because even though she had a lot of social troubles, she had people in her family, me included, and, you know, maybe some neighbors, family, friends who were giving her the message, there's nothing wrong with you. In fact, you're wonderful. You know, even when people her own age were rejecting her or thought that she was weird. And one thing that I've read about ADHD kids is that they often do quite well with older people and younger people, and that they do have a lot of trouble with same age people. And so older people and younger people can fill those social needs, maybe not quite as well as having a best friend or a best group of friends, but it's still important and something that you can do. Yeah. Okay. That's a relief because actually she does. She has little kid friends and then she has a few like adult friends that, you know, I think adore her. And I, that's a relief. I was worried. I was, thank you. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, my, my daughter said, mom, you're my best friend. I wish I had a another best friend, but I'm glad I have you or something like that. It's really sweet. (laughs) And now at 15, she's definitely moving away from me in a way that is really great. And we're still really close, but she is starting to get better. She's getting better at reading social cues, understanding people, looking for the nice kids. Like she, she's just started grade 10 and uh, she was super nervous about it and more nervous than she was starting grade nine. And I said, why are you so much more nervous about, you know, you've already been at the school for a year. And she said, now I know how mean people are. <laughs> so, pretty heartbreaking. But then she, after a couple of days, she came home and she said, mom, I realize I do know a lot of nice kids at my school and I just have to make more of an effort to like make friends with the nice kids. So I think this has been, I mean, I'm talking a lot about myself and I'm supposed to be coaching you, but I feel like you are where I was six years ago, except for I didn't know my daughter had ADHD then. So it was it was quite a bit harder, but I'm sort of giving you a little bit of hope from the future, maybe, I hope. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. No, actually, I really value the fact that you've had this experience because it's kind of lonely <laughs> in my parent community because I do feel like an outlier. You know, I kind of have the weird kid, and <laughs> you know, which I mentioned I adore I love I love having the weird kid but um I'm not really learning anything from you know my own personal community yeah even before I knew that my daughter had ADHD I remember it was at a high school open house for my oldest so it was probably seven years ago now and they were talking about how at this school we let our students be as big as they want to be and I had this flash of like oh my God, I've been keeping myself small my whole life. Like I just had that, like, I don't know. I never really had thought about it before. And I really thought, you know, I'm consciously raising my daughter to be as big as she wants to be. And so not only is there the sort of ADHD outlier, like making kids seem different, but I think if you are raising a girl in this culture where women are often taught to be quieter and smaller and not express their opinions as strongly, that's another layer, right? That that I imagine you are kind of contending with. Oh, absolutely. I think my whole upbringing was like, toe the line, be quiet, be invisible. And then um, I had this child who clearly was not going to be invisible right from the moment you know she entered this world. And I think at the beginning, it was a real struggle for me to think like, oh, this feels wrong. Like this is wrong behavior, you know, like, and, and I think it's been liberating because I just see her living full tilt life. 
And I guess that's where this comes up now. It's like, I see, you know, which I mentioned with the confidence that she's starting to dim her own light to kind of try and fit in. And I, and I guess I, I want to keep her feeling like she is perfect the way she is. She can be as big as she wants to be. Yeah. She doesn't have to change. Yeah. I think that it would be important to, I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with her about that. You know, I, I don't know if you could or if you talk to her about, you know, you you are different and you have more energy and you, I, however you want to describe it in ways that would resonate with her. And that's one of the most beautiful things about you. And as you said, you've been talking about her strengths. Well, when you were talking about strengths, I was reminded of, I think it was Ned Hallowell, who's an ADHD expert, who said that an ADHD brain is like a Ferrari with bicycle brakes. And um, I've always thought that was a really helpful way to to think about ADHD. And, you know, I told my daughter about that. But I think helping her, A, recognize that she is different, it's not her imagination. B, that there are expectations for how children are, for how girls are, for what it means to fit in. So that, you know, I think sometimes society can like gaslight you a little bit, you know, that there's, it's not something wrong with norms, there's something wrong with you. So I think helping her understand There is nothing wrong with you. You are different and you are amazing and you will find your people. And, you know, until then, how can you and your partner keep her self-esteem strong? I think that's your goal for the next couple of years. She might be lonely. How can you fill those social needs, either yourself or helping her find other neurodivergent kiddos? How can you help her understand that just because she feels different and doesn't fit in, it's not a problem with her? Right. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think that my own reactions have made this so large, but really the answers are pretty simple. And it's tough that I guess I know, you know, the most important piece is like in our home. This is like a microcosm of the world. And if if she feels loved at home, then she's going to find people that love her out in the world. And I think that I was really fixating on, you know, she's in this kind of change. She's moving outward, looking outward. And I have such an impulse to protect her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, from you know, like the mean kids and the I hear mean you. adults and the people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there. I'm a very peaceful person, but there have been times when I just want to punch people in the face when I hear about things that people have said or done to my daughter. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I know. I'm just like, <laughs> I like turn into a, to a like, you know, I think about myself as a flaming mother. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Well, and yeah. and you know, rather than aim that at the external world, um, aim it at your like fierceness of helping her believe that she's perfect just the way she is, and and let that you know be her mirror of your joy in her, your delight in her, your enjoyment of spending time with her, your appreciation of her humor and her, you know, you mentioned she has a great like physicality, like you can do a lot of this of helping to protect her self-esteem because you have such a good relationship with her. And for anyone who's listening, if they don't feel that they, you know, couldn't describe their relationship with their child as, as strong and close, work on that first. If you, if you want to be that for your person, for your kid. Yeah, this is so helpful, actually. I think that I really was lost in the larger pieces. You know, and part of the larger pieces, like we should go there a little bit, um, coaching her to stand up for herself, to, you know, not let people treat her badly, you know, have some stock phrases. Like my daughter and I were practicing that. And, you know, to say, if someone says something rude to you, say something like, I don't have time for this. Or, you know, that's like a 15 year old version, but, you know, having some sort of stock phrases that she can pull out if she senses that somebody is not being kind. And also, I think, you know, I don't know about your daughter, but a lot of kids with ADHD have trouble with some social cues. So you could work on, you know, I'm just kind of spitballing here, but maybe even from some movies or TV shows or something where you can watch like a social interaction and then point out different people's facial expressions, you know, sort of like case studies, <laughs> you know, right. when someone, I think that's important. Yeah. When yeah. someone does this, it means that And just even looking back to my daughter's early childhood, she was the friendliest little toddler preschooler that you've ever met. And she always wanted to talk to everybody and she couldn't understand it sometimes when people didn't talk back to her. So I, ta- right. I taught her if you talk to somebody and they answer you in one word answers and, and they don't ask you any questions back, that means they don't want to make a new friend. Just like that simply, like those two social cues, like they're answering you in one word questions, they're not asking you anything back, then that that means they don't want to make a new friend. And, you know, that way it wasn't about her. Like it wasn't like they're not interested in you, but they just, you know, they don't want to make a new friend. 
So, but, right. but she didn't pick up on that. I think probably my other two kids picked up on that naturally, but she didn't because she, you know, has trouble with social cues. Right. Exactly. That's one of our issues too. So that's a great idea. Like I can ask her, like we could, we could brainstorm together things that she could say. Cause she does have, you know, she has a couple of girlfriends in school, but they're really complicated relationships already. And I, I'd love to arm her with, you know, a couple of things that she could just say, mm-hmm. you know, when, yeah, when it gets hard. Yeah. And I, you know, with, and it's behavior she doesn't understand. She kind of comes home and the whole thing is so confusing. And yeah, yeah no, it's confusing for my daughter as well. She says like, why, why would anyone be mean to anyone else? She said, I'm just kind to everyone. I mean, I'm not saying she's right. perfect. I'm sure she has her moments, but, but in terms of being like conscious, like that sort of mean girl being mean on purpose, it just, it goes right over her head. She's just like, I don't understand it. Like, why would anyone do that? Right. Um. So I think also talking to your daughter about what makes a good friend and getting her to reflect on that, like, you know, what do you look for in a friend? What do you, what makes you feel good about spending time with people and asking some of those questions just to get her to reflect on it? Because of course you're not with her at school. I read some interesting research the other day that, that showed that through elementary and middle school, the meanest kids are the most popular, but by high school that actually changes because kids are like old enough and wise enough to know that, you know, that just because you're afraid of somebody being mean to you back, it doesn't mean you should you know, revere them. But I think that, that maybe you could help her with that knowledge earlier, right? Like, you know, the fear of somebody being mean to you doesn't mean that they should be the the ones that you want to try and be friends with. So what does that behavior look like? How does it make you feel? What do you value in a friend? So having those kinds of conversations too might help her when she is at school. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like I, uh, yeah, I have some great ideas. I, Honestly, it's so funny, like the places we get stuck. <laughs> I just was like, I can't figure this out. It's it's too painful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's incredibly yeah. painful. But it sounds like you were a little bit stuck on how do I make her friends rather than how do we yeah. make the needs that she has for being feeling good about herself and feeling connected. Yeah, I think I was because I was worried somehow, you know, and I know that it's like old data, you know, that you shouldn't be your child's best friend. You know, I had these little lines going through my brain, you know, which in truth isn't really relationship based parenting anyways. I mean, it doesn't have to. Yeah. You know, just old, old data. Yeah. I think that, (laughs) I think that whole, you shouldn't be your child's best friend. Actually, I, I, I got asked that in an interview the other day. And so I was thinking about it. And I think that basically means you shouldn't make parenting decisions or limit based decisions based on whether your child will be happy or unhappy with you. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be you know, close to your child or have fun with them or, or want to be in a relationship together. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I just feel like I've got so many ideas. I think I've been hesitant also to talk to her about it because it's just, um, again, it's a thing where I think that if I brought it up, it would be too painful. You know, that kind of juxtaposition that I think I kind of try and sweep it under the rug. Right. <laughs> you know, I talk a lot about like, oh, we have friends everywhere and neighbors are friends and acquaintances. But truthfully, I was knowing that I was avoiding the conversation because it was painful and that she was having primary relationships that she'd had her life just dissolve away. And it was confusing. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to answer it. You know, I didn't know how to answer like, why does this person not in my life anymore? You know, and I um, mostly would go to this place like, yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah you know. <laughs> they have bad parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like just like I was completely emotional about yeah. it. And yeah, yeah. Well, and she already knows that there's something up. So if you don't right. talk about it, it probably feels worse and scarier than it actually is. Totally. I know. Yeah. It it's super painful, Candace. Like it is. Like it, seeing our kids hurting is so hard and remembering also I don't I don't know what your childhood was like, but it brings us back to all of our own social struggles and our own memories of rejection and friendship troubles. And so I think it's also important to take some time to maybe reflect on that yourself, do some grieving, do some healing about your own, you know, inner nine-year-old on the schoolyard or whatever, so that you don't kind of mix that in with when you want to support your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. I feel like I've learned so much, actually. Just like, and to be honest, I'm like, oh, is this such a minor problem? But it wasn't feeling minor. It's not minor. It was kind of taking, oh my gosh, yeah, it was taking minor. up a lot of space in our life. It is not know? minor at all. Like, I think that's been like in my top, you know, top challenges over the last few years is worrying about my daughter feeling lonely and just, you know, wanting friends her own age. It's starting to happen for sure, but there were a couple of years where she, in, you know, pandemic on top of it, there were a couple of years where she was super lonely and she's such a good right. kid. Like I tell people who know her that she has, you know, trouble socially and they can't even believe it. Like, they're like, what? But of course it's people older than she is. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's going to change. Mm-hmm. Like everything changes, yeah. it's going to change. Yeah, it will change. So why don't we catch up in, um, you know, maybe longer than a few weeks, because I think that maybe, maybe you know, a month, month and a half. And just to give you a little bit of time and perspective on to see if it's shifted at all for you or for her. And then I can help you with any troubleshooting at that point also. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really grateful. You're welcome. Hi, Candice. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm well. How have things been since we talked? It was a month ago that we spoke. Yeah, things are pretty good. I feel like some we've had like quite a significant amount of kind of resolution around this in a really short amount of time. I don't know. Okay. What, <laughs> don't what, know. what happened? Tell me what made a difference. Tell me about it. Yeah, I think a lot of it, which I knew in the first place, was my own stuff. And I was just trying to navigate both my own triggers and my relationship to, you know, what was my responsibility for my child and what wasn't, what was my own story and what wasn't. You know, I followed some of your advice and I started having some conversations with my daughter about friendships and what kind of aspect made good friends, quality friends, what she was looking for in friends. And that had so much of an impact, had a, had a bit of an impact. We were, kind of opened that door. And I think I really recognized that my daughter is different than I am and her relationship to, re- to relationships is different than mine. And she actually seems pretty comfortable where she is right now. We're doing a little bit of counseling for anxiety and I replaced that with something. We we started doing an equine wellness program. I don't know if you're super familiar with that, but I had I have a very nature-driven child who connects with the outdoors and animals, and I'd heard about this program, and it's kind of geared towards people who might have problems with social cues. Actually, I think it's geared to a whole huge part of the population that connects with animals. But um, in particular, you had mentioned something about social cues, And I realized that it was something my daughter definitely doesn't see. You know, she's sensory seeking. Sometimes she comes at people really hard. She doesn't understand when people have sarcasm. She doesn't understand some people's context. There's all these things. And she loves nature. Mm -hmm. And so we signed up for like an unmounted equine wellness program. And she goes once a week and spends time with horses on a farm and I don't know. <laughs> are there leaders yeah, that are that are like guiding the program? There's a, there's yeah, definitely a facilitator who guides the program who uh, has a lot of experience with people of different like both physical abilities as well as different kind of cognitive abilities. And so it is dr- directly kind of you go and you get assessed. It's for mixed for mixed able and disabled people, this particular in pro in particular, this program, they aren't always. And so my daughter is, a, is in a group of four kind of preteens, herself and another girl are totally able bodied. And then there are two young men who one young man is nonverbal autistic, he's about 12. And they work together to clean stalls, muck stalls and pick hooves and brush horses and facilitated by a young educator who also has ADHD and dyslexia like my daughter and is very much a nature enthusiast, horse enthusiast. And it seems to kind of had the largest impact in the last few weeks. It's really, I don't really feel, I feel like that's where kind of her therapy is right now. Like she's less anxious. She's connecting with people that have similar interests in different age groups than she's familiar with. You know, they're older kids. The instructor I would say is maybe 28, really enthusiastic friendly, connects well, and it feels like a good fit for right now. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's totally awesome, actually. I feel like it's been a huge transform transformational piece. It's kind of a place where she's fitting in, and that's what we were looking for. It was kind mm -hmm. of looking for a place where she was going to find some people, you know, <laughs> that were her people. And I'm like, oh, this was kind of fortuitous. Yeah. Fell into it and yeah. That's great. And I think it also sounds like you realized that maybe she wasn't as unhappy as you thought that she was. She wasn't. I think she definitely was having a lot of anxiety in these relationships with her peers at school and in the neighborhood. But I well, let me let me rephrase. She wasn't yeah. as um, feeling as missing out as you thought that she was, perhaps. I think so. I think that she's having more of a fluid response to some of those dissipations, like of the relationships kind of disappearing. She's not clinging in the way that maybe I felt I would be. And I did see her like anxious. I saw her holding on and getting upset about some of the changes, but she seems very relaxed about it right now. That's we awesome. Spent some time, yeah, we spent some time with an old friend on the weekend for a few hours. And it was so easy for her to say goodbye. This is someone she would have considered a best friend until this past year. And it was just really easy for her to engage with this friend and also say goodbye at the end with no expectation of like best friends, see you tomorrow. There was none of that. She just, yeah, I feel like there was a big piece that's changed for us. And I felt really proud of her, I guess, and of me. <laughs> no. Good, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, what we talked about a lot last time was that our aim was to not have your daughter think there's anything wrong with her. And between sort of some conversations you've had about friendships, some sort of looking at who she is, not who you, how you are, who you think she might be. And also this new activity that she's doing. It sounds like it's serving all, th all of those things are serving that purpose. Right. Right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I know so. Yeah. And I mean, in the end, it feels kind of easy. Like we fell into the right thing, but I'd been looking for a little while. And I think sometimes it's that magic of like both looking and luck, you know, mm -hmm. For now, it's the right thing. It might not be forever, but she's kind of found a crew of people. And just the overall nature of it seems to be kind of leading her in that way where she's learning a lot about herself in a kind and loving way, you know, not in a way that is has anything to do with maybe her her weaknesses, but about her strengths. Yeah. And what yeah. they say about, about ADHD kids is that it's all about finding the right environment whether right. it's school or social or whatever it is, there's the, it's the, the pain and the challenges come in when there's a mismatch between the kid and the environment. Right. Totally. Totally. 100%. All right. Well, our work here is done. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, actually. <laughs> You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. I mean, I, I know she's young enough that I'm sure there still will be some, you know, challenges along the way, but hopefully you've come away with a confidence in what you can do and what you can't do and what she needs from you. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much. I think I just needed a different worldview kind of. Yeah, I know I did. I just didn't know what it was because you can't see it <laughs> when yeah. you're in it. Oh, well, that's what coaches are for. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.